So good morning, everyone, and, and, and welcome to Sunday worship service on uh, July 18th. It, it, it's hard to believe, folks, that we're, um, you know, midway through the, the summer, and um, there's been just so much going on uh, in terms of uh, COVID, um, a lot of us being um, at home under lockdown. But I'm really thankful that, um, you know, we're vaccinations are rising within the province and, you know, we're all at some point, you know, soon be able to see each other uh, face to face. And I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of us are really longing that um, face to face connection. Um, so again, welcome to Sunday worship service. And we encourage you um, during the service to um, please sing out loud uh, during worship. Um, uh, we know that uh, a lot of people in the congregation love to sing along to our, our worship song. So please do so. Um, I'd also encourage you to keep your cameras on during service only if you're comfortable, because it's always great to, to see everyone, even if we can't see each other face to face. It's great just to see everybody on 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 screen. Um, today for prayers of hope, um, Nancy Wong will be doing that. So um, if there are any prayer requests that you do have, you can message um, Nancy Wong directly or myself, or David Chu, and we can pass that uh, along to Nancy. Um, if you need assistance, any assistance throughout the survey uh, service, we have our Zoom moderator, Adam Wong, that's uh, online, or again, Dave Chu or, or myself. Pastor James is away on, on vacation right now, um, but we're really thankful, and we welcome Pastor Brian Yu, who's joining us to uh, speak today. And I'll do a bit more of an introduction to him when we get to... Um, when he's going to deliver his message. But thank you, Brian, for joining us and your, and your wife, Cynthia. I noticed she's online as well. Good to see you both. And um, after service, there'll be a few announcements and we encourage you to join our, our breakout rooms. It's a great way to just stay in, in connection with all of our uh, fellow brothers and sisters in, in Christ in our congregation. And it's a great time of fellowship with, with everyone. So with that, um, I will uh, pass it over to Adam Wong for our call to worship. So this is the call to worship. Everybody, I, I invite you to kind of join in with your mics on mute um, to read the all part. I'll be reading both the one and the all as a responsive reading. <clears throat> in moments of anxiety, God leads us to still waters. Oh God, we come to you. In moments of confusion, God leads us in right paths. Oh God, we come to hear your voice. In moments of loneliness, God is with us. Oh God, we come into your presence seeking your love. In all our moments, God is with us. So we come to praise the one who restores our lives. And now I'm going to be reading from Psalm 89, 20... Uh, 20 through um, 37. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their inquiry with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all I have sworn 
by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne, as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> um, and now let's all bow our heads for a uh, word of prayer. God, our maker, in summer, we easily marvel at the world you have made. The colors of sunrise and sunset filling the horizon. The intricate beauty of flower gardens and natural parks. The quiet dignity of a river in its course and the steadfast presence of a rock face carved over time. You show us how each piece of your creation depends in many ways on all the others. Summer growth depends on spring rains. Health for each creature depends on the wise balance you have set between each species. The quality of life <clears throat> on the respect we show one another. Wise and patient God, we marvel at the world you love. Our worship joins the songs of all creation to bring you praise, honoring you and the relationships you have set between us all through Christ, firstborn of all creation. Amen. If we could bow our heads in prayer for a prayer of confession. 
God, our maker, as we marvel at your creation, we confess we often take it for granted. We don't know what to make of reports about the damage human life causes. We prefer to live, live as if our lifestyles make no impact on the earth. We confess we don't really want to change, yet we wonder if the way we live is pleasing to you. For all the ways we put your creation at risk and harm the earth, we ask for your forgiveness. Teach us how to live in this marvelous world with love and respect for you and for your whole creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, everybody. This day, this is today's scripture reading from Mark 10, 35 to 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want to do for we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Benita. Um, I'd, I'd like to introduce um, Brian Yu. A, a warm welcome to Brian and, and his wife, Cynthia who's joining this, us this morning for our worship service. Uh, Brian Yu, has been, he's been serving God as a pastor for 14 years, and he's the executive director of Flow Ministries. And that's a Christ-led care and compassion ministry to the neighborhood of, of Kin Village, which is a subsidized housing community in Markham. I'm sure uh, many of you have probably passed by and are aware of it. Um, Flow Ministries was the recipient of the Matthew Lou Memorial Fund in uh, 2020, and, and Brian actually has attended one of our services uh, to accept the, um, the, uh, the Matthew Lou Memorial Fund Award. Um, Brian's passionate about getting people into close relationships with Jesus so they could have a tangible experience with Jesus in their own lives. Brian received his uh, Master of Divinity from Tyndale in pastoral ministry and is a resident of Markham. And Great news, Brian and his wife, Cynthia, are expecting their first child in the fall. That's just, just wonderful. Fun fact about Brian and Cynthia, they both don't watch TV, though they pay for cable at home because it's better to get a deal with a bundle. I think we can all kind of uh, uh, understand that. 
Um, we look forward to Brian's message today, uh, coming from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, and it's entitled, uh, A Pleasure to Serve. Looking forward to hearing your message, Brian, and welcome. Thank you so much, David. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, it is good to be with you all again. Um, as David had mentioned, my wife and I visited uh, your congregation when we were, the, you know, Flow Ministries was the recipient of the Matthew Lou Memorial Fund. You were meeting at PCA um, at the time. And I, I do remember two um, things about that particular day. One, everybody was so friendly. Like my wife and I were talking about it on the way home and we were like, wow, I, I don't know if we've been to a, a more friendly church. Um, and uh, it was really um, good to meet so many of you. And so many of you came up to us afterwards, just introducing yourself. So very friendly uh, community you have here. A second thing I do remember was that you were supposed to invite me to a barbecue. <laughs> And I don't think that happened, of course, because COVID, we got the, uh, uh, we were recipients of the fund um, pre-COVID. And of course, you know, you had plans to have a barbecue. That never happened. But I, I just want you to know, I'm still waiting on that invitation. Okay. So <laughs> when it does happen, do invite us back for it. So um, as David mentioned, um, I, I, I'm, I'm the executive director of a ministry called Flow. And uh, I'll share a little bit more about that towards the end, because we do want to get into God's word today. But I'll be throughout the message, I'll be sharing a few stories from, from our ministry over there. Do you remember the first time that you served the Lord? Do you remember one of the first ways that you served the Lord in any capacity? Now, for some of you who are much younger in the faith, it's not going to take you much to think about the first time you served the Lord, because that could be very recent. For some of you who are, you know, who've been following Jesus much longer, you're going to have to go back decades, maybe eons to recall the first time or the first way that you served the Lord. I remember the first time that I served the Lord out of my own desire, out of my own volition, like I chose to do this, right? Because there were times when I served the Lord and it was because maybe my parents made me do it or because my Sunday school teacher told me to do it, or whatever the case is. But I remember the first time that I chose to serve the Lord out of my own desire. And I joined the youth choir of our church. And I loved it. I was there for like seven years or so, um, participating in sort of that particular ministry. And I remember that really well, because a friend of mine had invited me and my brother to audition for the youth choir, right? There was a posting. He was like, hey, let's all audition together. Let's go. And so me and my brother, we auditioned for the youth choir. Surprisingly, we got in. I guess they needed help. I don't know. But we got in, loved it. Um, but the funny part was the friend that had invited us to join the youth choir and to audition for it, he never showed up to the audition. <laughs> he stood us up. And to this day, I don't have an answer as to why he never showed up to that particular audition. But I'll be forever thankful um, for that opportunity because it gave me a taste of what serving the Lord is like, especially as a younger person. It gave me a taste of what serving God is like. And it put me on a path, on the trajectory of serving God in different ways throughout you know, uh, my years here. Um, and so I've served the Lord as a camp counselor, Sunday school teacher, worship team, and of course, most recently, I've been serving the Lord as a, uh, as a pastor. So do you remember the first time that the Lord um, had called you to do something for him? And today we want to talk a little bit about serving the Lord and why that is important. I've entitled today's message, Pleasure to Serve. It's a common phrase that we hear, you know, from time to time when people are serving us or when we're serving other people, we might say it ourselves a pleasure to serve. When I'm doing ministry at Kin Village, a lot of the stuff that I do at Kin Village is very practical care in terms of nature. And a lot of the residents there have physical ailments of different um, kinds. And so whenever I do ministry there, they're always very grateful, right? They say, thank you. And I reply back by saying, it's actually my pleasure to serve. Because when I'm serving, I'm not just thinking about you, but I believe I'm serving Jesus. And of course, Jesus has served me first, 
We'll see that in our passage. Jesus has served me first. And so really, at the end of the day, it is my pleasure to serve. Now, we're looking at Mark chapter 10. And thank you to our scripture um, reader, I suppose, um, for uh, looking at the passage for us. So we're looking at Mark chapter 10. I'm not going to read the entire passage um, again for us, but I do want to point uh, to us towards the context, because that's going to help shed light in terms of what's actually going on here with what this request that James and John makes, right? What, what that's all about. So I want to point us to the context of what's going on here. Now we're in Mark chapter 10. Mark has 16 chapters. You wouldn't know it because there's like six chapters left towards the end of the gospel of Mark, but you wouldn't know it, but we're towards the end of Jesus's sort of earthly ministry, right? Very soon, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be sentenced. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He's going to resurrect, right? All that is going to happen very soon from this point on. In fact, when you get to Mark chapter 11, so if you've got your Bibles with you, right, and you look at Mark chapter 11, you're going to find that Jesus makes his way now to Jerusalem, right? That triumphant or triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. That's actually going to happen, Mark chapter 11. So we know that we're coming towards the end of Jesus's earthly ministry, right? His, his sort of three years of earthly ministry. Now, when you look at the context before our passage, right? We're looking at verse 35 today, right? We start at verse 35. When you look at the context before that, that's going to shed even more light as to what's going on here. So if you happen to have a Bible with subtitles, right? For, you know, in your translation, the subtitles aren't actually part of the, aren't actually part of the Bible, right? The editors or the translators will tell you that, but the subtitles are there to help us you know, kind of get a, an, an idea of what the content of that section is. Um, but the translators, at least in, in the translation I'm using, tells me that this section is about Jesus telling his disciples that he's going to die. And he has, he's doing this now for the third time. So my subtitle says, Jesus foretells his death a third time at least as recorded in the gospel of Mark. Now, Jesus may have mentioned it many more times to his disciples, but at least recorded in the gospel of Mark, this is the third time that Jesus is mentioning to his disciples that he's going to die. So throughout his ministry, as his disciples are walking alongside Jesus, Jesus has been communicating with them and saying, you know, there's going to come a time when I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And at this point in time, this is the third time, at least recorded in scripture, that he's mentioning it to his disciples. Now, understanding this context is important because now we can understand the request that James and John make here in the passage that we're looking at. Because they make a very odd request. Now, I'm going to unpack that in just a moment. But I want us to take a look at the request that James and John makes here. So the request. So verse 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him. It's referring to Jesus, him here, came up to Jesus and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, I just want to stop there because I don't want to assume that everybody on the call knows the different characters found in this story, right? Some of you may be quite new in the faith, and that's okay. Welcome, right? Um, and I want to be able to um, explain who these people are. So, of course, we all know Jesus, right? We're following Jesus, right? Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But James and John, who are they? Well, James and John are two of Jesus' disciples, right? They're brothers because they, they share the same father. It says right here, the sons of Zebedee. So James and John are two of Jesus' disciples. Jesus has 12 main disciples that walked with him for about three years, right? 12 main disciples. And James and John are two of them. Now, an interesting um, tidbit that most of you will probably know, James and John were also part of Jesus' inner circle. So among the 12 disciples that Jesus has, he also has 
three disciples that he took along with him on very specific and very special occasions. That would have been Peter, that, and, and that would be James and John. So they're part of Jesus' inner circle. Amongst the 12, there were certain occasions where Jesus only took three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. Now, James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, come up to Jesus, and here's their first statement. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Whoa, (laughs) pretty bold statement here, right? You know, who are you talking to, right? They're coming up to Jesus. We want you to do whatever we ask of you. As you can tell, this beginning, you know, the beginning portion of this conversation with Jesus doesn't seem to be going quite well right now, but they've got a request to make of Jesus and Jesus being ever patient is happy to hear this request because here's his response. Verse 37. Um, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? So Jesus, ever patient and ever thinking about serving people, responds by saying, well, what do you want me to do for you? Let's hear it. And here's the request that James and John make, verse 37. And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So they're making this request of Jesus, right? In your glory, let one of us sit on your right and let one of us sit on your left. Now for us common people, right? When we look at that statement, we're like, oh, what does that mean, right? Because when I'm in a gathering with friends, I'm at a restaurant, it doesn't really matter to me as a common person Whoever sits on my right and whoever sits on my left, right? Hopefully my wife is sitting somewhere beside me, right? When I'm at a restaurant. But if I got a bunch of friends, it really doesn't matter who's on my left, right? I guess it matters who's on my right when my wife is there. But really, it doesn't really matter what the seating arrangement looks like with us common people, right? But it gets more important, right, in the context of people who have power, position, and authority, So a king, for example, right, who rules a particular land or a particular kingdom, whoever sits next to the king are also important people. They also have a measure, maybe not as much as the king, but they also have a measure of power and authority and status. Not just anybody in the kingdom can sit next to the king. So we can see their request in light of the position and the power and the status that Jesus has. Because James and John, along with all the disciples, maybe except Judas, but along with all the other disciples, believe that Jesus is king, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Christ. And so you can understand now sort of the request that John and James are making here, that they're also requesting, as Jesus has a high position of power, authority, and status, they're also requesting for a measure of power, authority, and status as well. Now, we looked at the context a while ago, and this is really important to note, because what is James and John doing here? They're trying to secure their future. Right? They know because Jesus has mentioned it multiple times, at least three times, that he's going to die, right? He's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to rise again, he's going to come back in his glory. They know that's going to happen. They have an inkling that that's going to happen quite soon, right? As they're making their way now to Jerusalem. So they know that this thing is about to happen. And so they're thinking in their minds, what can we do? to secure our future now when Jesus comes back in his glory. Let's go and make this request of Jesus to sit at his right and his at his left hand when he comes back in his glory. Now, what's really interesting about this particular request is how it contrasts Jesus's ministry, because we see it in how Jesus responds later, that Jesus is about serving people. And as he's serving people, he's sharing 
the good news. He's sharing the gospel, right? He's helping people with their different needs, but also bringing reconciliation between people and God. Like that's what Jesus' ministry is about. And here comes James and John with this request. And it sounds quite selfish, self-centered, that they're thinking about themselves, right? And so um, in this particular instance, at least, serving has become a way for them to receive power and status and authority versus as a way to bring about what God wants to do in our world today. And so we see a little bit of self-centeredness start to come out in um, the life of James and John. Here's one lesson that we can glean from this portion um, of scripture. Serving isn't about us, but it's about God and what God wants to do in our world. Serving isn't about us, but it's about God and what God wants to do in our world. When we look at the life of Jesus, and James and John should have seen this, right? They've been with Jesus for three years, right? They should have seen how Jesus operates. When Jesus does anything, he does it in line with what God the Father desires in our world. And what does God want in our world? Right? He wants to bring a measure of peace and shalom to people, especially the peace and shalom that comes with having a relationship with him. God wants to bring peace and shalom in different areas of people's lives. That's why Jesus goes about serving in the ways of healing. Jesus goes about serving in the ways of providing for people's needs, right? But also preaching the gospel so that people will know how they can have a right relationship with God. So there's something that God wants to do in our world today. And Jesus participated with God the Father in bringing that into our world. Here we have James and John, right, at least in this particular instance, not thinking about what God wants to do, but thinking about what they can get out of this particular ministry. Serving isn't about us. It's about what God wants to do in our world. It's about God and what God wants to do in our world today. You know, when I think about this, I think about one of our um, volunteers at Flow Ministries. I'm going to call him Chris, you know. Um, I won't give his real name. But I think of one of our volunteers who um, um, one day my wife and I were at Kin Village just going around the neighborhood and we spotted Chris, you know, approaching one of the neighbor's homes. And we said, hey, Chris, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm coming out to, to you know, to the neighborhood to change a light bulb. Now, at that time, I'll be honest, I'm like, people need help with light bulbs here at, at Kin Village? And, I'm, and, and yeah, that, that's what he was doing. And, uh, you know, I didn't think of much, much of it at the time, but a couple of weeks ago, I was at Kin Village and one of the neighbors asked me to go and change a light bulb. I'm like, we've got a light bulb changing ministry here at Kid Village. And what I didn't realize at the time when I was thinking about Chris was um, the light fixtures at Kin Village are made of very old material. And old material tends to be very, very heavy. So these, uh, the light fixture itself um, the cover was made out of pure glass. And so it's very heavy. I almost dropped the thing. If I, and if I dropped the thing, it would have shattered into like a thousand pieces. Um, and if it dropped on a person's head, it could possibly like really injure them. So it was made out of really um, heavy material. And it, it took me a while to, to change that light bulb. It was really, really difficult. And I like to think I'm physically capable um, and I had a really hard time. And so I can imagine some of the residents at Kin Village with, who have multiple ailments having a really difficult time changing some of the light bulbs there. So I, I understand now why Chris was there that day helping to change a light bulb at Kin Village. But he was there. And I didn't know at the time, but the neighbor came out and greeted Chris with a happy birthday. I'm like, Chris. It's your birthday, and here you are serving at Kin Village, right? And that's because he wants to. He wants to be here, and he's thinking about the neighbors, but he's also thinking about God, what God has done for him. But he's thinking about God and what God wants to do in the neighborhood, right? Think about it. What day of the year is it about you? It's your birthday, <laughs> and here he is serving other people. So I think about Chris, when I think about this idea of selflessness, right? 
that really when it comes to ministry and serving other people, it's not about us. It's not really about the other person too, although it's more about the other person than it is about us. But really at the end of the day, it's about God and what God wants to see happen in our world today. Um, Many of you know the Lord's Prayer, right? And there's an interesting line there that Jesus tells us to pray similarly to, right? Um, Jesus says, um, pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? There's locations in that statement, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's something beautiful going on in heaven, and God wants to bring a measure of it here on earth, right? On earth as it is in heaven. And part of the way that we bring a part of heaven here on earth is through how we serve in the name of Jesus. So serving is a way for us to participate in what God is doing in our world today, which is bringing shalom in different areas of life but most especially the shalom that comes with having a right relationship with Jesus, with God. So serving um, is doing what God wants, right? So serving isn't about us. It's about God and what God wants to do in our world today. Now, let's take a look at what happens next. So they make this request of Jesus, and we get to verse 38. And here's Jesus' response. So we looked at the response, uh, uh, sorry, the the, the request of James and John. Now we're going to look at the response of Jesus. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. (laughs) Clearly they didn't. You do not know what you are asking. And here's something interesting that Jesus says right after. He says, "Um, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. So James and John make this request of Jesus. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking about, right? Are you able to do certain things? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? A bit of a tongue twister there. Now, what's Jesus talking about here, right? Um, are, you know, is Jesus talking about like a literal cup? And a literal sort of baptism, right? Does Jesus have like a, a cup of coffee or, you know, he's holding, he's like, are you able to drink from this, you know, cup that I'm drinking right now? Are you able to do the baptism that, that I did when I was, you know, at the Jordan River? Or is he talking about a literal cup that James and John can drink? Because James and John later go and say, well, yes, we can, right? We can drink the cup and we can undergo sort of the baptism that you went well, Jesus isn't talking about a literal cup here, and he isn't talking about the, 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 the baptism that he had with when John the Baptist had baptized Jesus. These are metaphors for something. So when Jesus talks about the cup here, he's talking about the cup of wrath that he's going to endure and bear as he's bearing our sins, right, on the cross, Now, we know that it's the cup of wrath because Jesus mentions that much later in the book of Mark where he prays to the Lord, um, where where Jesus prays to God the Father and says, if possible, take this cup away from me. So that's what he's talking about. When he's talking about this baptism, he's not talking about the baptism in the Jordan River because James John would be like, yeah, we're headed to the Jordan River right now. Let's get baptized. That's not what he's talking about. It's, again, a metaphor for the suffering and death that he is going to endure right? Suffering, death, and resurrection. So he asks them, right? Are you going to be able to drink the same from the same cup? And are you going to um, be able to partake in the same baptism that I take? And James and John respond by saying they can, right? Verse uh, 39, and they said to him, we are able, we are able, quite confident, For these disciples, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So Jesus acknowledges that they will be able to partake in that type of suffering ministry with him. Not in the same way, right? And not for the same purpose, right? Jesus' suffering and death, all of that was to pave the way for our salvation today. 
right? To pay the debt that we could not pay, to pay the penalty for our sins. They're not going to be able to do that in the same way that Jesus did, but they're going to be able to have a measure of, of experience in terms of suffering and pain as well as they're going about ministry in the name of Jesus. Jesus acknowledges that James and John will also be persecuted in a similar way that Jesus did. Again, not for the same purpose and not for the same reason and not to the same extent as Jesus went through, but they will have a measure of that as well. So Jesus acknowledges that they'll be able to do it. However, his answer, his answer is still no. (laughs) Jesus says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, right? It's God the Father who will grant that. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus at the end still declines their request. You know, just a side note here, because when I was studying this passage and, you know, doing my devotions at the same time, you know, I realized, yeah, you know, sometimes we make requests of God. We pray to the Lord. Did you know that no is a legitimate answer? Like God will say no to some of the requests that we make of him, right? And here we see an example of Jesus clearly saying no to James and John, that he cannot grant that particular request. So just a side note there that no is a legitimate answer from the Lord. Um, So um, they make that request and look at what happens next. Look at the reaction So we looked at the um, request of James and John. We see the response of Jesus. But look at the reaction of the other 10 disciples. Verse 41. When the 10 heard it, right? Because again, there's 10 disciples. When the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Now, the word indignant isn't a word that we often use. Like, I don't use the word indignant at all. Um, (laughs) Um, except maybe with this particular passage and preaching it. Um, but indignant means there's, a, um, there's an annoyance that they had, or even an anger that they had towards James and John because of the request that they made to Jesus. Now, this could be for two reasons. One, um, perhaps... Um, uh, they wanted to make the request themselves. They're like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Like, I wanted to also be on Jesus' right side or left side, right? We should have thought of that too. Or they were like, who are you, right? To think that you're going to be on Jesus' right and left and be over the rest of us, right? Like, who, who are you? And so there was this annoyance, this frustration, this anger, um, all of a sudden that they had with James and John. Now, again, remember context, right? Very soon, Jesus is headed towards the cross, right? Very soon from this point on. And at this point, his disciples seem to have a form and a measure of disunity going on, right? The team that Jesus has built for three years, there's, it's starting to show some cracks, some, you know, you know, is it about to collapse, right? Something's going on here. And Jesus needs to clarify, um, you know, this idea of leadership, this idea of serving um, to his own disciples. Because really, at the end of the day, he's building a team that will carry forward the mission that he started. So here's the lesson um, that uh, Jesus presents to the disciples upon hearing this request. Verse 42, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, right? Gentiles mean non-Jewish people, right? The, you know, unbelievers, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Like this is what the world is known for, lording it over other people and vying for positions of power and authority and status, money, wealth, all of that. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Again, like this idea of lording it over. Verse 43, here's the lesson. But it shall, uh, but it shall not be so among you. Amongst you, my disciples. 
the believers, the church, right? It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So in a world, he says, the world is known for, right? Lording it over. For having positions of power and status. For the idea of being served, right? The idea of me being served, because Jesus talks about that later, right? But not so among believers in Jesus. Among believers in Jesus, you are to be known for something else. You are to be known for serving. Now, I can understand as a human being with temptations, right, and a sinful human nature, I can kind of understand the request that James and John makes here. You know, they're wanting to secure their future, right? Who as a parent doesn't want to secure the future of their children, right? That's why we get education and we get good jobs and we um, try to make as much money as we can because we want our, secu- you know, our future to be secure. How many of us like to be served? Right? So I can understand James and John, right? I like to be served. <laughs> this past uh, weekend, my wife and I, we went to the restaurant you know, because we were able to do so finally. <laughs> and we, we liked being served and we got served really well at the restaurant by a guy named Justin. We want to be served. So I can understand the desire and the temptation that James and John have here. It's a very human thing, right? A very worldly thing. Um, But when it comes to God's kingdom, God's ministry, again, it's not about us, but it's about God and what God wants to do in our world today. And we're just participating in what God is doing in our world And instead of being known for vying for positions of power and wanting to be served, we should be known instead for serving others. And that's what Jesus says. He says, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So if you want to be great in God's kingdom, it's not through power and a status and authority and wealth. It's by serving, Jesus said, because that's what James and John were kind of asking in the end, that they wanted to have great position by being next to Jesus. And Jesus says, it's not so among you. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. How many of us want to be great? How many of us want to be great? (laughs) Of course, nobody's going to admit that, right? Like, we're really humble people, Yeah, you know. You know, humility, one of the fruit of the spirit. Uh, Oh, sorry, the fruit of the spirit, part of it is humility, right? We want to be humble, right? Okay, we all want to be great. Um, But what's really interesting is that Jesus doesn't close the door on this idea of being great. But he says, here's how you're going to be great, right? Because that's what he says, right? Whoever wants to be great, right? Among uh, whoever, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Greatness will not come through the power and status and authority, but through serving. And that's why Jesus is the greatest, right? Jesus is the greatest, right? Jesus is first. Why? Because of his serving and his ultimate sacrifice, his ultimate form of serving by dying on the cross for our sins. And his motivation was pure and holy. That's why we say that Jesus is the greatest because of the purest way that he has served us. So if there's something that we should be known for as believers in Jesus, it should be for our serving of other people. Now, this is really hard because, again, those temptations come, right, where it's about me or what I can get um, uh, about my securing my future, right? And serving is really hard because serving entails that we give something up so that we have something to give. Serving is hard because it entails us giving something up so that we have something to give. I'm giving up time. 
or I'm giving up resources, right? So that I have something to give to somebody else. I had to learn that lesson early this year um, when one of the neighbors at Kin Village called me up at eight o'clock in the evening asking for some help. And this neighbor um, is completely bedridden. Um, and what had happened was her cat had gotten loose, had gotten out of the house. Like one of the PSWs had left the door open, cat was out. And this happened like in the dead of winter. This was January, right? And so the cat was out. And so the neighbor started calling some of our volunteers, couldn't reach anybody, finally was able to reach me and asked me if I could come and help find the cat. Now, I'll be honest. I didn't really want to go looking for the cat, <laughs> right? One, it was like at eight o'clock in the evening. Two, it's the dead of winter. It's really cold. Three, I'm not like Chris. It was my birthday. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be out there on my birthday. I'm not like Chris. Um, um, you know, we were, me and my wife were winding out, down our day. We were picking like a movie to watch and things like that. And um, so I didn't really want to go, go out at that time. Um, but as I was pondering upon that situation, the Lord prompted me, right? The Holy Spirit has a way of just like convicting you of stuff. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of what Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And with that prompting from the Lord, my wife and I made, you know, made our way to the neighborhood to go looking for this cat. My wife, you know, as we get to the place, my wife starts to take care of, our, of the particular neighbor while I go looking for the cat. Now, I thought I would be there all night, honestly, because we've tried this before and we were not successful in finding the cat. Um, I thought I would be there all night. The Lord brought success. I'm out there calling the cat's name. Ten seconds later, cat comes right into the house. Right? We close the door and uh, we're off on the way home. Best part was we get to watch our movie that we picked out <laughs> for that particular day. Right? But the Lord had to teach me something that if I wanted to serve, it's going to entail me giving something up, right? whether it's time or resources or energy or whatever the case is, me giving something up so that I have something to give. But hopefully at the end of the day, what we will be known for as believers is well known for our service. Here's the last thing, okay? Here's our model and motivation for serving. Um, serving is a way for us to imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man, now I don't have time to unpack sort of that statement there, but many of you will know Son of Man is referring to Jesus. Son of Man is a phrase, uh, is a messianic phrase um, uh, that tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, we get that from the book of Daniel, but yeah, um, for even the son of man, so referring to Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is how Jesus, Jesus operated. This is like his purpose statement here um, as, as he was uh, in, in our world, right? He came not to be served but to serve. And the greatest way that Jesus has served is by giving his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus becomes our model for serving, right? Because throughout his ministry, not only did Jesus preach about the gospel, but Jesus served people in concrete ways, right? We see that throughout his ministry, but he also becomes our motivation because as Jesus has served us first and served us in the greatest way by dying on the cross for our sins, as he has served us first, we serve Jesus in turn. So Jesus becomes our um, model and motivation for serving. How many of us often say we want to be like Jesus Anybody wants to be like Jesus? Anybody? Yeah. Everybody wants to be like Jesus. Y'all want to be like Jesus. You know what? You, you know what is one of the simplest ways to be like Jesus is? It's by serving somebody. Whether it's serving people here at your church, here at Celebration Presbyterian, whether it's serving the people around you, the friends that be uh, that God has brought into your life, the family members, right? The the neighbors the co-workers that God has brought to you, right? Serving them or serving in particular ministries um, that you know of. One of the easiest and simplest ways to imitate Jesus is by serving. And as Jesus served, as he served, he preached the gospel 
and he made disciples, right? And so that's sort of the same perspective. As we serve, we also preach the gospel and make disciples. Let me end with this last story, okay? Um, <clears throat> so at Kin Village, um, there's a particular neighbor there who I think is like our person of peace. And um, he, uh, he's a person who's been in a wheelchair ever since he was born, but he's got multiple illnesses um, that make it really difficult for him to do um, like everyday physical activity that we take for granted. Um, but recently I've started to call him my assistant. So when I, you know, whenever I'm at Kin Village and I have the opportunity to do so, right, I visit him and I ask him to come along with me just to be there, right, when I'm doing ministry. So on one particular occasion, we were visiting one particular neighbor who was like completely bedridden and uh, we were just there and having a conversation. Like a lot of our ministry is just talking to people right? Because they're, you know, they deal with loneliness and things like that, right? And so they want prayer. And so we're there just having a conversation. And so we're having a conversation. We have a really good conversation. Towards the end of that conversation, we're about to leave when my assistant, right? This neighbor who lives in that neighborhood, right? Um, he goes and he says to the other neighbor that we just visited, hey, if you need anything from the grocery store, I'd be happy to come and bring it to you. If you need one of those cases of water, you know, those 24 bottles of, of water in one case, I can put it on my lap, on my wheelchair, and just bring it over to you. And I was astounded by that, right? Because here's a person, right, who I know has multiple, like, physical conditions, but with a heart of service, um, and so as he started to get to know Jesus, started to draw closer to Jesus, there's this desire in him to serve in his own way. Like for us, we, you know, we, you know, we take stuff like that for granted. Like I can carry a case of water, put it in my car and, 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 and no problem for him. He's going to have to like travel to like the, the TNT on his motor, a motorized um, wheelchair, get the case of water, put it on his lap, bring it all the way back. Right. But it really taught me something. Right, it taught me a few things. One, the selflessness that he has in thinking in this way to, you know, to, to, to help this neighbor with their needs, but also the simplicity of it. It wasn't very complicated, right? It's like go to the grocery and you know, bring like a case of water. You know, just simple ways to serve a neighbor. And I just love that. It's a, it's a story that has inspired me to continue serving the Lord. Now, for some of you here today, you know, as an application point, for some of you here today, you're not serving the Lord in any capacity yet, right? That's okay. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray about it. I want you to pray to the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want me to serve you? Maybe there's something that he will bring at your church context. Maybe there's something that he will bring in terms of your friends and family. Perhaps there's a ministry that he will bring along um, uh, where you can participate in. But ask the Lord to assign because the Lord is the king. He knows what needs to be done and ask the king to assign you a place um, of ministry in his kingdom work, kingdom agenda. Now, for some of you who have been serving Jesus for a while now, maybe there's a place where you can serve more. Perhaps the Lord is challenging you to serve more because here's the truth. Oftentimes, right? Okay. Maybe I shouldn't say oftentimes, but sometimes <laughs> we serve the Lord out of convenience. I wonder if we should also serve the Lord out of inconvenience in the midst of inconvenience. So it's not just serving God in the midst of convenience, but serving the Lord in the midst of inconvenience. And again, asking the Lord, to direct your steps in terms of that particular ministry where he wants you to serve. So um, if you give me three more minutes, I'd like to share just a little bit about our ministry at Flow um, and, and what we do. Um, and, and you can pray for us, right? And um, if, you're, if the Lord leads you and prompts you to serve with us, um, we could certainly use the help. But let me share real quick a PowerPoint slide. And uh, uh, which, oops, which will showcase a little flow um, real quick. Okay, let's see. Here we go. All right. 
So our, our full name is Flow Without Bounds Ministries, but also Flow Ministries is actually what um, is also our, our sort of our organizational name. So both of them are acceptable, um, but the full name is Flow Without Bounds Ministries. Here's just some of the pictures of our, of our ministry here um, at Flow. Um, and as um, David had mentioned, a while ago, Flow Ministries is a Christ-led care and compassion ministry to the neighborhood of Kin Village. How many of you know about Kin Village? Like, just, you know, raise your hand real quick. Um, you've heard about Kin Village. Kin Village is a subsidized housing community in Markham, uh, which is at Woodbine and 16th. So very close to PCA, where you used to meet. And so I don't often talk about my ministry at Flow with the different churches that I visit um, because they, they're not in the neighborhood. But I felt really inclined to talk a little bit about our ministry with your group because many of you live in Markham, or at least right now, your church is situated in the Markham area. And so Kin Village isn't in Scarborough. It's not like downtown. Kin Village, it's in our neighborhood. And a lot of people, when I mentioned this um, to them, it's a, um, <clears throat> oops, let me just... No. Okay. A lot of people in our na- a lot of people that I mentioned this to are surprised that there's a subsidized housing community in Markham and it's well hidden. It's hard to, you know, a little bit hard to find because it's not like you can see it clearly from the road. Um, um, but it does exist and it's here. And a lot of the neighbors at um, Kin Village are in unique circumstances. And those unique circumstance ra- circumstances range from um, physical and mental health challenges to um, a substantial number of single parent homes in the neighborhood, um, but also um, issues with regards to financial capacity, right? And so this is in Markham. This is in our particular neighborhood. I just want to share a little bit of the things that we do just so that you get an idea in terms of what we do here at, at, at Flow Ministries. We've got a Christian mentoring program um, for the kids there. Um, And that's one of the big things that we're developing um, over the next couple of years. Um, In fact, our uh, stream mentoring director, Jess, is on the call today. You know, Jess, just wave a bit. (laughs) But yeah, she's here. She's been with us now. She's been a mentor for for several years, but she's been our director now for for about six months. Um, So we've got a mentoring program for kids. So if you're interested in mentoring uh, a child in the neighborhood, right, we really need mentors. There's a lot of children in the neighborhood. Um, We've got um, a practical care ministry and some examples of what we do. We deliver groceries because, again, some of the neighbors are either bedridden or have multiple ailments that make even going to the grocery very difficult. We sometimes bring meals to people who cannot cook, right? Um, Taking out the garbage. Like, we take this for granted. Like, on garbage day, right? Like, we can just bring stuff, you know, garbage out. But, like, for some of these neighbors, again, this might be a very difficult task. Trimming bushes, hedges, right? Driving neighbors to and from doctor appointments. Um, So, those are just examples of some of the practical care stuff that we do at Kin Village. We've got an annual hampers program. So, giving, um, so people give uh, to neighbors in terms of essential goods and uh, uh, essential food items, um, and other, uh, other items that neighbors may need. So we have an annual hampers program that happens in the Christmas time. And then we've got events. Um, a lot of these events we weren't able to do in the past year and a half because of COVID, but normally we have an Easter service right in the neighborhood. We've got a summer barbecue usually in the summer and uh, a Christmas party in December. I'm still hoping that we can have a Christmas party this year. We'll see what we can do. And then, of course, we've got neighborhood times of worship and discipleship. So we gather some of the neighbors together to worship the Lord together and to do prayer and uh, reading scripture. So here are some of the ways that we serve at Kin Village. Um, Now, uh, here's what I want you to do. And this is where I'm going to end our time. I'm going to put something here on the chat. Okay. Any of you are interested in knowing more about our ministry at Kim. You don't have to commit to anything, right? But you're interested in knowing more about our ministry here at Kin Village, or you're looking for opportunities to possibly serve in a simple way, right? Um, especially in our mentoring program or any of our practical care ministry. I want you to go to this form and put your name and email address. And what's going to happen is we're going to get in touch with you. Okay, so click it now so that you don't lose it, because once you get out of the call, when you leave the call, you're not going to be have access to chat. Right. So click it now 
but also the information about our organization is also found on that form. So uh, the slides that I just showed you right now, they're on the form here. Um, we have information about our mentoring program. Again, that's number two on the form. Okay, so it's in the description. And lastly, we have our newsletter. Our latest newsletter, <laughs> the newsletter is found also in the description in, in number three. Okay, in link number three. So all the links are there. And if you want more information or you're interested in serving in some way, right, um, let's chat. So put your name, uh, your email address, and then we'll, we'll get back to you, right? Because when the call ends, you're not going to have access to that link, okay? But yeah, thank you for having me here. And um, um, it is a pleasure to serve alongside all of you in God's kingdom work. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for your... Your, your message today. It, it was certainly um, inspiring and, and enthusiastic and for sharing about, you know, Kin Village and, and, and your stories. And at the end of the day, I think serving really is about God and, and what he wants us to see in our world today. And, and the point that resonated with me uh, during your uh, message was, you know, serving is really giving something up so that we have something to give. So thank you once again for sharing. Um, right now, probably in the um, chat, you may see um, a push pay link uh, for um, offering. If you're joining us today um, as a guest or, or for the first time, please do not feel uh, obligated to give. Um, let us pray for the offering and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are God and there is no other. You are God and there is none like you. You love us with an eternal love, and we give you our offerings as an expression of our love to you. We pray our gifts would be used to extend your kingdom. May you, the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory by Jesus Christ, make us holy, strong, and filled with peace. To you be glory and honor forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, we're going to uh, have our prayers of hope now. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you created, Lord. Thank you for this day that you gave us to come to worship you, Lord. Lord, we pray that our worship would be worthy in your sight. Father God, thank you for the power of prayer. Thank you for hearing our prayers and knowing what is on our hearts, even before we come to you. Lord, we pray that you would be with Pastor James and his family, Ginny and, and Leo right now as they are on vacation. Help them, Lord, to have a good time of rest and a time of reconnecting as a family and um, um, reconnecting with Ginny's family in Ottawa as well. Give them a safe trip back, Lord. Protect them and watch over them, Lord. Lord, we pray for Pastor um, Brian, Lord, and his wife, Cynthia, Lord, as we rejoice with them, Lord, as they are expecting their first child soon. Thank you for this gift that you've given them, Lord. We pray that you would continue to be with Cynthia, give her strength and good health, Lord. And Lord, we pray for a safe and healthy delivery of the baby as well, Lord. And Lord, we pray for um, our search committee at our church, Lord. We pray that you would be with the committee, give them wisdom and discernment, Lord, as um, we search for a new pastor, Lord. Provide us with a pastor who would be a good fit for celebration, Lord. Um, somebody that um, will be able to, to work alongside with us so that we can um, continue to grow, Lord, as, um, as a congregation, Lord, and so that we can continue to bring honor and glory to your name, Lord. We pray for the process, Lord, as um, it is a long process, Lord. I pray that you would um, help us to be able to do all that needs to be done, Lord, um, in terms of um, even writing the profile and, and just all the legwork that needs to be done, Lord, a lot of the behind-the-scenes work. 
Lord, we pray for the situation in Barrie. We pray for those who's, who's, who uh, had their homes displaced due to the tornado this week. We thank you, Lord, that there were no fatal or very, very serious injuries, Lord. We um, pray for the two people that are in the hospital still. We pray that you would um, help them to recover, Lord, and that you would help them to be better so that they can be released from the hospital. Lord, we pray for all those families whose homes were displaced. We pray that you would help them to find adequate accommodations and, an ad and a place to stay while their homes are being repaired and restored, Lord. Lord, we pray for um, all the damage to the businesses as well, Lord, that you would help those business owners to be able to, to restore their, their uh, place of work so that they can go back to their employment, Lord. Lord, we pray for everybody who was impacted in any way um, during that tornado. And Lord, we, um, as we look around the world and we look in Ontario, Lord, we continue to pray for the COVID-19 situation. We thank you, Lord, that as the vaccines are increasing, Lord, that um, um, it seems like we're maybe seeing some improvement in the numbers, Lord, and the caseloads every day. We pray that as this province opens up and those restrictions are loosened, that you would continue to keep everyone healthy and safe, Lord. Protect us and watch over us, Lord. Lord, we pray that the numbers and the cases would not increase too much, Lord, even though the restrictions are being loosened. We pray that you would continue to give the government um, wisdom to make good decisions, Lord, and the medical profession um, give them wisdom as well so that they could make decisions as well as to how to keep um, our province, our country, and the world around us safe, Lord. Lord, we pray um, and lift all these things into your hands. Pray all this in your precious and most holy name. Amen. Let's end our time in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for how you've served us through your death on the cross and the victory that we have because of the victory of your resurrection. Thank you for the ministries that we can partake of. At the end of the day, Lord, to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach people everything that you have taught us. And so, Lord, as we go now, would you dismiss us with your guidance? For some of us who would like to know how you want us to serve you, Jesus, would you reveal that to us? Dismiss us with your power because we need your power as we go and minister to people in different capacities. And dismiss us with your love. With that foundation of love, we are able to love other people. Dismiss us now with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>